Welcome to Ilford High Road Baptist Church. We are fully back into church this weekend with the first of five all-age family services, which are much more difficult to record and then put online. So we're going to record something from home for each of those five weeks, and we hope that that will continue to be a blessing to you. Uh, do please get in touch with us for information about our services, which will be at 10.30 for the next few weeks, or if you'd like someone to talk with or to pray with. Our Bible reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. Luke, chapter 18, and from verse 18 to verse 27. A certain ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honour your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then, Come here, follow me. When the man heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with men and women is possible with God. Forgiveness is free. Salvation is by grace. And yet that is only part of the story. We often say that we cannot earn God's favour. We cannot buy God's forgiveness. And we never can deserve the gift of life and the home in heaven. And that's absolutely true. We cannot. They are all gifts of grace, which we receive through faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And yet that is only part of the truth. After all, genuine faith will inevitably lead to major changes in our life. For example, we cannot ask for forgiveness unless first we accept that we've been wrong. And if we recognise that we've been wrong, then don't we want to change for the future? This weekend in church, two ladies are being baptised. They're going to confess their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They will tell us that they are trusting him for all that he has done for them. They are affirming that they are ready to follow Jesus. And so they will be baptised. In our reading from Luke chapter 18, the rich young ruler came to Jesus with a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's like he says, I've got resources, I've got plenty of money, I could do all sorts of things. Just tell me, what would you like me to do? And Jesus said, well, how about the commandments? And he said, well, I've kept all of those since I was a child. Maybe he had lived a good life. But he wasn't perfect and he needed to see that. Jesus then instructed him to sell everything that he had. But notice this was not Jesus' answer to the man's question about how to receive eternal life. This is what the man needed to do before he could trust Jesus and begin to follow him. It is difficult to understand what Jesus says here without either falling into the idea of thinking everybody has to sell everything or not taking Jesus' words seriously at all. Now, Jesus didn't say this to everyone, but he did say it to this man because he needed a rethink on this issue in particular. A rethink about his riches. He needed to learn that he cannot buy eternal life with his riches. And a rethink about his lifestyle too. He needed to learn that he couldn't merit the gift of life simply by keeping the commands, although that's a good thing to try. And we all need a rethink of some kind 
if we want to come and follow Jesus? Are there ways in which you think that you deserve God's favour? Maybe by your achievements, your morals or your good deeds. We need to stop. We need to put all of that down and we need to rethink. Because only then can we come and truly follow Jesus. Jesus calls us first to come to him. And we come to Jesus through repentance and faith. Repentance for what we have done in the past and faith in what he has done. Some of the things that we've said and done have been wrong and we need to turn away from them. And we need to turn to Jesus, trusting what he did for us when he died on the cross and rose again. Now, repentance and faith belong together. Saving faith in Jesus includes repentance. And we repent in the context of the faith that sees the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word for repent is related to the mind and involves a, a change of mind. Like the change required in the rich young ruler to understand that neither his wealth nor his goodness was enough and that he could neither buy nor merit eternal life. But this word often translates a Hebrew word in the Old Testament section of our Bibles, which has the thought of turning around. And repentance is the complete turning of the whole of life to Christ. And that leads to changes in our behaviour, our actions, our speaking. Because true repentance realises that we have been wrong. It comes with deep regret for things in the past and a commitment to change and be different from now on. Faith means that we stop trusting either in our wealth or our holiness or our good deeds. And we start trusting in what Jesus has done for us. He died upon the cross for us to take away our sins. And there's nothing more that we can do. There's nothing that we need to do. He's done it all. And then he rose again from the dead to give to us life, not through our money or keeping laws, but by trusting in him who died and then rose for us. So it is with repentance and faith that we come to Jesus. So first we come to him as Lord. The Apostle Peter had walked with Jesus for three and a half years and so he knew him well. And in the Bible we have two of Peter's letters. In the second of which Peter says four times, our Lord and Saviour. Now you may have heard it said that first we come to Jesus as saviour just to receive his forgiveness and then later we learn to follow and try to obey him as Lord. I think that's a recipe for disaster. If we come to Jesus then we must come to him as Lord and saviour. Jesus is the Lord who saves us. You know more than 80 times in the New Testament section of our Bibles we find the phrase, the Lord Jesus Christ, or he is called Christ Jesus, our Lord. And yes, that speaks of his deity and so calls us to worship him. But it's more than theology, it's our relationship to him. Jesus deserves our total loyalty and obedience as Lord. Not just on one day at our baptism, but every day. Not just for the two ladies who are being baptised this weekend, but for all of us. Repentance is handing over our lives to Jesus as Lord. I'm no longer the one in charge. I don't just do things every way that I please. I live under Jesus' Lordship. Now that's not a harsh thing, it's actually the most wonderful thing. I come to him as Lord and as Saviour. Saviour, because Jesus is the only one who can take away our sins. He is the only one who can set us free from guilt. He is the only one who can break the power of sin over us. Only Jesus has overcome death and can share that victory with us. Only Jesus has prepared the home for us in heaven 
Only Jesus can raise us from the dead, transform us, and then make us fit for that home. He can and he does save us. He alone. Our money cannot do it. Our good life cannot do it. Our good deeds for others, they cannot do it. The Lord Jesus alone can save us from our sins, give to us eternal life and bring us to heaven. You may have read that recently our Prime Minister confessed that he thinks he uh, is a very bad Christian because he thinks that Christianity is a superb ethical system and he falls a little short. There's another Tory MP who doesn't think that the Prime Minister has a single religious bone in his body at all. But either way, and I'm not going to judge, Christianity is not just a superb ethical system. We did not come to Jesus simply as a superb moralist. The rich young ruler had to learn this. His keeping the law was good, but did not merit eternal life. And if we think that giving away all of his riches was the way to inherit eternal life, we've missed the point of what Jesus said. That was only the precursor to coming to Jesus in repentance and faith. The same is true for us. We cannot earn or buy eternal life, either by our morality or by giving away our riches. But we can come simply to the Lord Jesus, the saviour of the world, who alone can cleanse our conscience, reconcile us to God the Father and give to us life. Will you come to him today? Will you say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for all that I've done wrong? Will you say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying and rising again for me? Will you say, Lord Jesus, I stop trusting my moral values and good deeds. I trust you as Lord and Saviour. That would be a great response. In fact, it's the only right response and it's a wonderful start to a new way of life. Jesus said to this man and he says to us also, come here. But then secondly, Jesus calls us to follow me. We talk about following in the footsteps of others. You know, we want to do the same thing that they did. How many of you have tried to wear mummy's shoes and walk around the house in them? I remember when I was young, seeing the strength of my father's arm when he was sawing some logs and I wanted to be like him. But when carefully he supervised and let me hold the sword, I discovered just how hard it was. But Christians want to walk in Jesus' shoes. We want to follow in his footsteps and be like him. And so we want to follow his example. Jesus' example of prayer. He got up early before dawn to be alone and spend time with God the Father. Now, early morning may not be the best time for you for all sorts of reasons. And maybe midday or early evening might be your moment. But to follow Jesus is to develop a regular pattern of prayer. We have Jesus' example in learning the scriptures. As a young boy, he went with his family to the synagogue and to the temple in Jerusalem. And we know that he learned the scriptures. He used them in his parables and he used the scriptures to help his disciples understand who he is and why he had to die and rise again. To follow Jesus is to learn the scriptures. And we have Jesus' example in the place of worship. How often the Gospels begin an account of one of his miracles by saying he was in the synagogue and it was a Sabbath. On one occasion, Luke writes, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath as was his custom. It's what he did. The Lord's Day was given for us to be in the place of worship together. And to follow Jesus' example is to be with others in the place to worship God. We have Jesus' example in forgiving others. Despite many criticisms and accusation, Jesus forgave and never harboured a grudge. Peter three times denied that he had ever known Jesus. And yet after his resurrection, Jesus took Peter aside and made sure that Peter knew that he was forgiven. As soldiers nailed Jesus' hands and his feet to the cross, Jesus asked the Father to forgive them. 
And to follow Jesus' example is to forgive others. We could go on and add so many more. We saw other examples earlier this year in our our series, Walking as Jesus Walks. And as we looked at Elisha's life, we saw in him those qualities as a minister of grace that we see most fully in Jesus' example. We're called to come and follow Jesus' example. We're also called to follow him in obedience. Because Jesus is Lord, we not only follow by copying his example, we follow him by being obedient to what he says. Now, that's not always easy. For a start, we don't like anyone telling us what to do, even when we want other drivers to stick to the rules of the road. Or we're a little anxious because people go into a shop and and maybe have decided not to wear their masks. We simply don't like others telling us what to do. But Christians willingly submit to Jesus' lordship and listen to what he says. A soldier in the army or a pilot in the air force make only one response when their commander tells them to do something. And that response is yes. And believers in Christ have only one proper response to the Lord Jesus' commands. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, in everything. Not because Jesus is some hard commander, and I'm not saying all commanders are like that either. Jesus is the most humble and gracious Lord. He's done everything for us, and and so we love him. And when we love him, then we will keep his commands. We will keep his command to forgive others. We will keep his command to love others. We will keep his command to gather together on the Lord's day. We will keep his commands to trust in God to provide. We will keep his commands by being patient and thoughtful and humble. And in all these ways, we obey him. We're called to come and follow Jesus by obedience. And then finally, we're to follow him on all of our front lines. And front lines is where the action is. Wherever And whatever your action is each day of the week, know this, God is interested, very interested. Our front lines are everywhere we go and in everything that we do. The message is a paraphrase of the New Testament part of the Bible. And in Romans 12, it says this, take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. We're called to follow Jesus in all of our everyday, ordinary life. Actually, that makes everything special because we do it for his honour. So we honour him in the way that we write a letter or answer the phone. We honour him when we teach the violin or set a price for a job, as we drive a lorry or plumb the sink, when we bathe a patient or write a prescription, as we teach the class or run a business meeting, in the way we advise a client, in changing a nappy, helping with homework, writing the essay, doing the shopping, visiting the theatre, taking the children to the park, cooking dinner, washing the clothes, ironing the clothes, mowing the lawn, repairing the car, preparing the accounts, working at the till, Hoovering the carpet, cashing the checks, stocking the shelves, typing the minutes, decorating biscuits with the children, waiting for the bus. In all of this, we take our everyday, ordinary life and we place it before God as an offering. And this is the way of life to which the Lord Jesus calls not only the two ladies who are being baptised this week, but the way of life to which he calls all of us. Baptism is a special moment, but it's one moment in our life of faith and following. How then will you respond to the Lord Jesus today? Perhaps you need to come to him in repentance and faith and trust him as Lord and Saviour. Or maybe it's a time for you to recommit your life to follow him. Will you live in every place, in everything? in every relationship as Jesus did? Will you walk as he walked and and serve as a minister of the grace of God? Will you take your everyday, ordinary life 
and place it before God as an offering. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you that it is through your death and through your resurrection that you offer to us forgiveness and eternal life. Lord, help us to have that rethink if we need, so that we may be sure to turn to you and to trust in you. Help us to follow you in every moment of this week. We offer to you today our everyday, ordinary life as an offering. Whether we shall be at home or at work, whether we'll be on school holiday or waiting for GCSE and A-level results, whether we go to the shop or to the park or we're in our gardens, in everything, help us to live as you did, with compassion and kindness and forgiveness. We pray for children who are on school holidays. And although lockdown rules have been relaxed, some parents may be a little anxious. We pray for them as they guide their children. We remember those who are waiting for GCSE and A-level results and how this will affect their future. And we remember those at university waiting to see if they can proceed to the next year. We thank you that lockdown rules have been relaxed. And yet we have seen this week how it brings concerns over rising rates of infection. And so we would pray for doctors and nurses, for all who work in hospitals. We ask you to keep them safe and help them as they care. And may all of us be sensible. May we be thoughtful towards one another. We pray for churches as they open up again and as we enjoy the opportunity to sing psalms and songs as we praise you. Yet may we be aware of others. Some of us return to church with great joy. Some of us have found this last year really tough. And Father, some of us have experienced pain and tears. And we offer to you today both our rejoicing and our mourning. We ask that you will continue to strengthen and to help us as we navigate these coming weeks. We pray your blessing upon us as once again we enjoy meeting face to face, sharing news and life together. We pray too for our nation, for our Prime Minister and all of our MPs as they continue to face difficult decisions as the Covid situation continues to fluctuate. Give them the wisdom that they need, we pray. We ask too that you will oversee the discussions in Parliament and more widely on assisting dying. May we and may our leaders recognise the supreme value of life as we have been created in your image. Father, instead of helping people to hasten death, give us grace and compassion to, to be with others through the last stages of life, living with true dignity as we trust our days to your care. And for those around the world who face troubles and pains. Father, for families who have lost loved ones in the flooding at a train station in China. Those who flee violence and poverty and risk their lives in dinghies to cross the channel. Those in southwest Iran in very high temperatures who face severe water shortage. And those who suffer due to the increasing troubles in Afghanistan. Lord, have mercy, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us this week. We pray that it has been a blessing to you and look forward to seeing you next weekend.